Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Sanjay Reddy. I teach in the economics department at the New School. And uh, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you uh, to the uh, first session of uh, the conference India's World today, uh, which is entitled Science, Technology, and Education. And uh, more specifically, uh, it will have a focus on India's IT industry uh, and will center on a paper by um, Ajit Balakrishnan called India's IT Industry, The End of the Beginning. This session will run until noon, and there will be an afternoon session which begins at 1.30 this afternoon and will run until 4 o'clock on literature, culture, and the media. And the second session later in the afternoon, which will run from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m., on the theme of law, sovereignty, and justice. Uh, I believe that all of you uh, will have received a copy of the conference program, but if you have not, it should be fairly easy to get one outside of the room. The, uh, the presenter of this morning's paper, Ajit Balakrishnan, is the founder, chairman, and managing director of Rediff.com India Limited. I asked him uh, before the session this morning where the name Rediff came from. And he gave me an answer which has still left me wondering exactly where the name Rediff came from, so maybe you can ask him again and he'll give us a bit more insight on that. As you know, Rediff.com is one of the most successful uh, media news websites in, uh, in India and uh, is, uh, has been very instrumental in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Indian new media. He is also a director of Rediffusion Dentsu Young and Rubicam Private Limited, India Broad Publications in New York, Value Communications Corporation, and View Bytes India Private Limited. In addition, he serves as chairman of the Board of Governors of the Indian Institute of Management, Kolkata, and chairman of the Working Group of Internet Governance set up by the Government of India. Uh, I have had the benefit of reading his paper, unlike perhaps all of you, and so I know that he's going to take us through a capsule history of the IT sector in India. And uh, I will introduce our two discussants after he is done, who will, I hope, provide us with some provocations. So, thank you. Uh, please join me in welcoming him warmly. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, those of you who missed a, a really fantastic session yesterday from Amitabh Ghosh, uh, where he talked about uh, what a boost to India's GDP the early opium trade created, uh, I think uh, one of the most interesting speeches I've ever heard. But today we will talk about something perhaps a lot more dramatic, how the Indian IT industry came out of almost nowhere about 15 years ago, and today um, accounts for nearly $40 billion in revenue. It employs 2 million professionals and accounts for 5% of GDP. Uh, it's also resulted in the changing of the perception of India from a place of magic, magic carpets to a, a knowledge repository in the world. So a dramatic transformation took place, and. Uh, I wanted to, to briefly trace some of that and also point out some of the implications of this dramatic growth, good and bad. I think um, when you look at these things, it looks as like these things happened overnight and dramatically. But it was a long time coming. You know, it was a really long time coming. And some people say that uh, if you take that first slide in that corner, it, the word algorithm itself, the foundational idea of IT industry worldwide, is a corruption of the name Mohammed bin Musa al Khwarizmi. That the, I think his, he used to work in Baghdad's House of Wisdom in 825 A.D. And the 12th century Latin translation of his book called Algorithmi de Numero Indorum directly meant al Khwarizmi on the Hindu art of reckoning. So he described the zero, one to nine system which was used in India and brought it to the Western world. To that extent, you could use just those nine digits and a zero and express any number. 
So the world algorithm in a foundational sense was, came out of that book. The second slide, which is the, the, you know, the contribution of Lord Macaulay in 1845, who headed the Committee on Public Instruction, resulted in India being the only large non-Anglo-Saxon country where the entire higher education system is in English. That was a contributing factor as well. And then you look to the left and you see Gandhiji's design for the flag during the independence movement, and you'll see a very curious object in the middle, which is a hand-spinning wheel. Uh, Gandhiji's foundational idea for the Indian independence movement was that the Industrial Revolution, with all its inventions, had destroyed the livelihoods of people in India. So that kind of got translated by the Indian elite in two, different, two or three different ways. One of the most important thing was there is a deep-seated conviction everywhere that if you have lost out, quote unquote, lost out in the Industrial Revolution, you just cannot afford to lose out in the Information Revolution. So that is again a foundational idea among policymakers. And finally, the Digital Revolution was caused by, I think, a series of inventions of the semiconductors, microprocessors, computers, PCs, algorithms, internet, and the web. And digitization made services tradable long distance. I think that's a, these are the kind of four millennial ideas which contributed. Um, what created India's IT industry again overnight, apparently overnight, was some actions went lasting nearly 40 years. Through the 60s, when India was mostly an agricultural country, 90% of Indians were agricultural, some visionaries thought of investments in the IITs, the Institutes of Technology, the IIMs, and the higher education system. And I'm glad to note that some of the early funding came from Ford Foundation, and which is, I think, also one of the sponsors today. So I think you know, the whole arc got completed in a fundamental way. I think um, what is important here is that uh, uh, people who were running a very poor agricultural country thought of investing in issues like technology and management at a time where it was relevant to maybe half a percent of the population. And then in the 1980s, a major bank and railway computerization projects where visionary bureaucrats, uh, among them Dr. Sheshagiri, uh, insisted that most of these projects be done using Unix and relational database systems and in an era where mainframes proliferated. In other words, a, a cadre of eight to 10,000 programmers got created who anticipated what later came to be known in the computer industry as the client-server revolution, the move from mainframes to PCs. Uh, and finally, in the 1990s, immense social revolutions at that time created all kinds of fiscal deficits, and the rupee declined. And the dramatic rupee decline really meant that a programmer who viewed from the United States appeared to cost $4,000, would now cost only $2,000. So it's a tremendous cost difference appeared. Um, there were industry trends as well. I think the so worldwide software industry was created when IBM was forced under antitrust trust legislation to separate out the prices for hardware and software. That was the foundation of the software industry in the world. Uh, the 1980s saw the Microsoft processes and client serving curve revolutions. And in the 1990s, a famous or infamous Y2K frenzy, which created a demand for tens of thousands and often hundreds of thousands of programmers. India was ready. Everyone needed English language, client server uh, type computing programmers. I think, uh, what were the cascading effects of that? I think uh, uh, the cascading effects were something like this. I think the IT industry growth, which was tremendous, I think it, 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 that kind of growth created a demand for nearly two million programmers in a period of five years. Uh, that created a real estate boom, and I think, it, I think nearly $16 billion of annual spends went into the domestic market where revenues from abroad were used to build you know, large setups. Um, it created world-scale real estate construction companies. I think two million young professionals were relatively well paid, created offices, homes, cars, consumer durables that kick-started the economy, which is almost dead in 1990. As you know, India had borrowed money from the IMF to just pay monthly bills for food, and that transformed it overnight. Uh, it also set off a higher education boom. I'll give you one a brief stats from here. The output of engineering grads grew from 45,000 a year to 445,000, actually in about 10 years' time. That's the kind of scale growth which happened. And almost all the growth was from private college, so-called private colleges. Now, this has uh, had pluses and minuses. This has resulted today in um, large-scale 
expansion of the education sector. There were not enough teachers to teach. And I think nearly 20,000 colleges got set up during a period of nearly seven to eight years. I mean, the world probably has not seen, even our cousins, the Chinese across the Himalayas didn't have to do all this in such a short period. It has had its uh, pluses and minuses. I think I was in Uzbekistan two weeks ago, and many young people who I met on the street and in bars said, we don't like going to college. And I said, I asked them, what's your problem? Said, if you go to college, there are no jobs. Now, it's very important that the Indian growth was a demand-led growth. Whoever graduated got a job. And that kind of situation, so this is a good problem to have in a very fundamental way. Uh, but the challenge is that if you recruit 100, try to recruit programmers, so every 100 that you interview, barely five to six of them know anything about programming. So we have had an immense quality crisis, which has also got created. The system is also... Uh, created a political economy in Indian education, which those of us who are connected with the policy making area are really struggling to encompass. One of the things about India is that while labor costs in teaching, teachers, professors, etc., are probably one eighth to one tenth the cost of the US system as a comparison, but real land costs between three and four times the US, and construction costs are five to six times. So there is a different kind of economics which sets up. So when this tremendous growth happened, uh, the people who got the approvals to start colleges were largely low-level local politicians. So it's created a political economy where these 15 of the 20,000 colleges are controlled by local politicians. Change is difficult. Any kind of reform system which is currently being tried is meant with immense pushbacks. So we have, I think, it's a good problem to have, but we don't know how to solve it yet. Uh, here is a story. I think, um, you know, it's worth also thinking how India handles technological threats and challenges, you know, apropos the having lost the Industrial Revolution story. In 1917, Gandhi arrived from, India, from South Africa. Nobody knew who he was in India. Nobody knew. So some peasants in Champaran in Bihar called him for help. He went there. Seven months later, he was a leader of India. And from 1917 to 1945, he led India to independence. But here is a side story to this. When Gandhi went there, he saw that Champaran tenants uh, were bound by law to produce three out of every 20 parts of land with indigo. And he felt that it was an oppression and they had to produce it at any price available. Uh, uh, what was behind what was happening was in 1895, Indian exports of indigo, we dominated the world market for indigo, was 187,000 tons at 11, uh, Deutsche market had dropped by half in price and one tenth in terms of output. British farmers, uh, Shekrop, pushed local peasants to grow, and Gandhi ran to the help of the local peasants. But the real issue was, uh, in 1856, Perkin, encouraged by a German professor, tried to synthesize quinine from coal tar. He created essentially the synthetic, uh, you know, the synthetic chemical industry was invented to find a solution to indigo, okay? Look at the trajectory. In 1856, he had the first model. 1870, Bayer tried to synthesize it, didn't fail, didn't succeed. Lab scale was accomplished in 1880. 1882, a new route for, to synthesis was created. 1890, in Zurich, synthesis was done, but too expensive. 1897, they got the breakthrough. Hext, master process engineering, they, they won 80%. So what Gandhiji was arriving at was the end of a long period of technological invasion, invention. Now, the real question was, uh, very often in India, there are strong incentives for technology innovation. We find other solutions to the same problem, normally labor created. Here, for example, in Indian outsourcers get paid per seat for most things that they do, including programming. There is no incentive to reduce seats. They, they try and, when they're under technological threat, they go up the revenue stream, again using labor to do consulting. Indigo growers were paid per kilo, no incentive to reduce the kilos of indigo sold. So they prefer switching to other crops. So I see an immense parallel in the way we're ta tackling technological change. Now look at this, the German trajectory after the indigo synthesis. If you look closely at the names of Bayer, BASF, et cetera, the A in it stands for aniline. And aniline was the original foundation business was to crack the, you know, the indigo dye business. So aniline is from, as you know, from the Hindu uh, uh, Indian word for neel, for blue. Uh, 1930s, accidentally they discovered that the red azure dye kills streptococci bacteria, from which the active ingredient, sulfanilamide, was create, uh, isolated, and that created the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, and it's associated institutions which last till today, the patent system, process engineering, chemistry teaching, etc. 
Unfortunately, Gandhiji had declared victory and moved on to somewhere else. But I keep looking back, I wonder what is the victory he achieved. And this was a very, you know, the Champaran story is taught to every English Indian schoolboy. So, you know, you know this. I think he said, you know, the system was ab abolished and probably 500 peasants were saved, but a whole opportunity passed. Hmm? Finally, I think the. Uh, Sorry, I think I have one more slide. Uh, I think the real challenge that we face today is coming back to the challenge that the ID industry faces. There aren't enough people to do this immense opportunity which stands before us. Uh, the educational value chain uh, throughout the world, I think, uh, including the United States, has been built on the old industrial revolution model. I think what it basically does is it, it has standard tests for taking in people and sending people out, standard textbooks, okay? Students are brought into factories which we call colleges and schools, uh, exactly like in the Industrial Revolution period, and learning is from the teacher. Uh, one of the big issues that we find today is this is turning out to be too expensive. It's not just in the United States, even in India, it is too expensive. Uh, it is at odds with the way, and I, I've been experimenting a lot with this in India, how people learn. There are multiple in intelligences. People learn at varying speeds. What you teach in the first three years of college almost is 1% of what he needs to learn as you go along. For example, when I came out of IIM Calcutta as a graduate in 1971, the microprocessor was not invented. Microsoft had not been founded. Virtually everything that I do today, I have learned along the way. So I look back, what did IIM Calcutta teach me? Maybe it taught me a curiosity, an intellectual curiosity. And I think one of the big challenges before us is that tacit knowledge is more important than explicit knowledge. The pace of learning is different. And I think um, students learn more from each other. In some of the new media, new social media technologies, which are coming at a very early stage, has created successful enterprises like Facebook. But my view is that it's a very early stage that new technologies initially get used in the boy-girl romantic context. But it's the real applications, which as it should be applied in education, are still before us. So I hope. Some of you will throw light on that today for me. Thank you. Okay, um, our first discussant is uh, Professor Anindya Ghosh, who is uh, a professor in the Stern School of Business at New York University. And uh, he has a very extensive uh, set of credentials, which I won't go through, uh, except to say that he is doing very innovative work on um, understanding the economic consequences of the internet and in quantifying the economic value which it generates, for which he received the um, uh, very prestigious National Science Foundation Career Award. Um, so without further ado, Anindya. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, thanks, Sarjun and Arjun, for having me here. It's a real pleasure. Uh, it was also a pleasure to read your paper, Ajit, um, partly because it's very well written, and also partly because a lot of the things that you talked about in your paper, I personally went through in the mid to late 90s. Um, so to give you a background, in the mid to late 90s, I used to work in the Indian IT industry uh, for uh, Hewlett Packard, IBM, HCL Infosystems, so while I was reading the paper, I could in many ways identify with many of the issues that you were talking about. Um, so in the 10 minutes or so that I have to sort of you know, throw in my uh, views on Ajit's paper, um, I thought I'd hit on two points um, briefly now and then expand on them later on uh, you know, while, while we have the discussion. Um, so the first point was about, uh, you know, one of the things that I sort of struck me in Ajit's paper was the issue of uh, can countries sustain themselves based on low labor cost uh, practices um, and sort of the, you know, the, the, the relation to this particular paper was that uh, much of what you've seen in the Indian IT industry in the last, uh, you know, 15, 20 odd years has been uh, sort of the outsourcing of, you know, low labor cost practices. There's been, uh, there's not really been much uh, work in the, in the context of creating real intellectual property, real value added services. 
So, uh, but things have been changing on that front, and so I want to sort of share with you some of my observations while working with companies here and as well as back in India on, on some of these issues and talk about how things are changing. And the second thing I'll uh, briefly open up and talk about is, uh, you know, this issue of uh, how can we use IT to change the quality of education um, in across the globe. Okay, um, so I'll talk briefly about my experiences in using social media. Uh, in the classroom, um, and I've been using this across, uh, you know, several different places here in the U.S., in India, in Asia Pacific, in South Korea, Japan. I've been teaching a lot of these courses, so I thought I'd share some of my experiences and uh, talk about uh, the opportunities and challenges in that space. Okay. So uh, the first thing is about, uh, you know, what what I sort of see as um, sort of the shift in focus in India from um, low value-added services to sort of more intense, intellectually vibrant, value-added services. Um, I think there are a number of reasons that are going to be driving that change, and we see that happening already. Um, so one of, first of that is uh, demographics. Okay. Um, so if you look at, you know, sort of the, uh, the aging, the age of the, uh, the labor pool across the globe, uh, you see certain trends. So there are countries like India, Philippines, Indonesia, and so on, where uh, you've got a very strong, robust base of, uh, uh, you know, the labor pool, which is not aging as fast as the rest of the population. Um, compared to, let's say, China, just because, you know, China was the benchmark yesterday, um, you know, it said that by 2020, 2020 China's labor pool is actually going to shrink much faster than uh, its uh, population. Uh, so I think changing demographics is going to play a big differentiator in sort of India's uh, you know, role going forward in uh, taking a stronger lead in these rich value-added services. Uh, the second area is innovation. Um, you know, so I was in Bangalore. Uh, Bangalore is a city in, uh, in India. If some of you haven't been there, it's sort of considered the Silicon Valley. I was in Bangalore last year in November. I was attending the NASCOM uh, meeting. Um, NASCOM is a national association of chambers uh, where you sort of have many serial entrepreneurs Many companies uh, uh, come in and give talks about their new ideas, new products. And one of the striking things I saw was, and I talked to a lot of the people over there, um, you know, when I was interacting with them, is that people, uh, a lot of the skilled IT uh, services professionals are actually sort of jumping ship from, um, you know, very high-paying, lucrative uh, jobs in the outsourcing BPO sector uh, to uh, starting companies on their own. Uh, so there's, there's a real trend of entrepreneurship um, in India. Um, so w one, of the th one of the examples that really struck in my mind was uh, this company called uh, Forest, um, Forest Health, um, started by uh, K. Chandra Shekhar. So um, his, his idea was simple but very effective. Um, so if he studied the, the number of blind um, you know, patients in India, and he found that most of the 12 million people who are blind in India, uh, that blindness could have been avoided if those, the blindness was actually detected early enough in their lives. Uh, the problem is the detector that, or the machines that are used to detect a blindness early in your life is extremely costly. It used to cost around $60,000 uh, till before last year. So Chandra Shekhar and his buddy actually opened up a firm where they essentially came up with uh, uh, you know, a, a, another product, a much less costly product, costs about $15,000 now. And in about 10 minutes, it actually detects uh, various kinds of symptoms of blindness. For example, you know, if you've got a diabetic retina, it will detect it. And so this frees up the doctors from uh, you know, administering all of these tests to actually working individually with the patients and detecting these things. Um, and so, you know, this was this a small example, but uh, very effective. And I thought this was, you know, one of the highlights of the serial, serial entrepreneurship that I've been seeing in India. Uh, there are many such examples. You know, Vishal Gondal opening up India Games. Vishal Gondal is about 23 years old. Is uh, you know, sort of equated with Bill Gates in many ways. Um, and then it's not just folks in India who are doing this. So I actually met, uh, briefly met Valerie Rosicky, uh, who's a I was a student at Stanford, and she was in Bangalore, and um, what she was doing was a very innovative idea. So, you know, if you've been in India, you know this concept of missed calls, where, um, you know, we often give missed calls to a family and friends, and it's because, you know, uh, incoming calls can be expensive, so we don't want to sort of uh, rake up their bills, so we give missed calls, and it could be something like, oh, I love you, I'm coming back, you know, uh, you know um, we sort of pre-decided what the message is, but she took that idea and said, um, let's see how mobile marketing can be 
can change based on that idea. And so uh, she opened up a, a company called uh, ZipDial. It's based in Bangalore. And, and she, what she does is when you have these nationwide contests on TV where people have to log in to give votes to artists or uh, you know, actors or dancers, uh, they can do that using zip, uh, missed calls. So you don't actually have to call the company and rake up your incoming bill. You can just give a missed call and, and say you know, who you're voting for. So you know, again, it's a very innovative idea from someone who, was, who wasn't born in India but came all the way from the West and actually started this really novel uh, um, idea. So, you know, I thought a lot of those examples, and I can keep going on, but um, a lot of those examples to me suggest that uh, innovation is becoming big, and uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more uh, big shift away from uh, the low-cost value-added, low-cost services to actual intellectually vibrant value-added services moving along. Um, and uh, and so so that was sort of my you know and again I can elaborate on this later on but that was my first point about the change in shift change in focus in India from low value added services to higher ones. The second one was was about how do we actually use IT to uh, you know address this gap in the quality of education and uh, what are the you know opportunities and challenges here. So. Um, so you know, one thing that I thought would be worth talking about here is the use of social media in the classroom. Um, so I'll give you some examples to drive, try and drive home the point. So um, you know, the various kind of social media technologies that many of us have been exposed to are you know, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and so on, blogging, uh, podcasts, videocasts, and so on. Um, so one of the things that Ajit mentions in his paper is that uh, you know, a lot of the uh, educational value systems, these, uh, you know, most of the educational value systems are designed towards standardized textbooks and standardized curriculums where there is very little room for the teacher or the educator to actually you know, adapt the course or the material based on the actual intellectual content of the students in the class. So you know, some, some years you get great students and sometimes you don't. And so, uh, you know, the use of standardized textbooks and standardized curriculum and syllabus is probably not the right way to go about every single year. So, um, so this is where I actually sort of uh, thought social media comes into play very, very effectively. Um, so, for example, if you understand the concept of wikis, um, you know, you can have uh, course wikis where uh, every year what I do is, uh, for, for a number of my courses, I start uh, a course wiki where students can participate by putting in their thoughts on what my proposed syllabus is, uh, and I'm, I also have sufficient details for them uh, to interact in that manner. And as in the course progresses, um, I get feedback from them on uh, the course materials, on the lectures, and so on. So, and very often, I've been able to adapt my teaching style and the pedagogical style early enough in the course to reflect the the sort of the you know the intellect in the classroom. And as I said, uh, since I've been doing this in several different countries, uh, it really works. You know, it uh, uh, I see the differences. Uh, I see the same course using very different styles. And uh, wikis is just one thing. I mean, I've been using blogs. I've actually been using Twitter as well. Um, so the first time I uh, sort of used this, uh, there was a fair bit of you know, skepticism about, oh, why do we need uh, Twitter in the classroom, or, um, and so on. So I started by making it very simple. I said, hey, guys, if you have any questions after class, just tweet me, or tweet it, and then I'll respond. And so people will say, oh, does that mean that I can't raise questions in the class? I said, no, you still can have your hands up and ask questions. But some of us are a little shy. Some of us don't want to ask questions in class. So you can just post the question on Twitter. I had similar things with Facebook uh, class pages and group pages where I would encourage people to uh, post. And sometimes they would, I would also say, if you want to post anonymously, don't sort of reveal who you are. You can still do it. Uh, if you're still shy about revealing who you are. As long as you get the answer to your question, uh, you know, you get your, the bang for your buck. Um, so, you know, so there is, uh, you know, my sort of personal belief is there's immense potential in the use of social media to customize teaching, to make sure that you're not standardizing, you know, it's not one size fits all. Um, and so, um, and I'm, I'm sort of pretty upbeat about it, and I can talk more about it later on if you have any questions. So I thought those are the two things I want to hit today and then talk more later on. Okay.
Okay, our uh, last discussant is um, Bruce Nussbaum, who is a professor of innovation and design in the School of Design Strategies at Parsons uh, here at the New School, and is also a contributing editor to Business Week. And was uh, and here this this excited me a great deal. He was named one of the 40 most powerful people in design by ID Magazine in 2005. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was number 39. <laughs> Barely squeaked in. Um, and I write for Fast Company now. I don't write for Business Week anymore since it doesn't cover innovation or design. And it's really a miserable magazine owned by Bloomberg. So there you go. Um, I'd like to pick up on a, a number of the themes that uh, were expressed earlier here, uh, agreeing with some of them and disagreeing uh, with some others. Um, India has some marvelous strengths that I think play really well to IT. Um, uh, and one of them is uh, it's uh, a wildly innovative culture. Uh, business model innovation in particular seems to be uh, something that uh, works really well uh, within the Indian uh, economy. And it is something that's just beginning to take off now. You mentioned healthcare. Healthcare. Uh, that there's a revolution in uh, providing low-cost health care to a large number of people going on in India that is eminently uh, exportable uh, and uh, should involve and could involve, as it scales up, uh, an incredible amount of IT. Um, there's an awful lot of innovation going on in retail, uh, uh, delivering uh, small amounts of products to variety, a wide variety of uh, uh, villages, cities, neighborhoods, in a way that uh, you don't see it here, you see it uh, in India. Again, it's sort of a low-cost retail distribution system that has uh, wildly applicable uh, uh, means around the world coming out of India. Let me go down. The whole mobile cell phone revolution that's really being led in part in India, using mobile phones to do many of the things uh, that my students uh, here at Parsons would love to do, paying uh, for things through a mobile, uh, finding information about prices, which is only now coming into the U.S. context, has been going on in India, uh, especially in the rural areas, for a long time. This is uh, uh, wildly innovative and, again, imminently exportable. Um, and even if you don't export it, India is just a vast, vast economy with vast population. Uh, a huge role for IT to play in that. Um, what else? In manufacturing, if the nano uh, actually comes out of the factories and gets into uh, the marketplace, the way it was developed was quite creative. And again, it was frugal innovation. Uh, not only is there business model innovation, frugal innovation itself has a deep, deep tradition in India. And the nano was developed in a very frugal manner. Um, we're still waiting. I, I drove it when I was there a couple of months ago. Uh, great car, hugely spacious inside, beautifully designed. Not sure it's really designed for a rural area, be a great city car here in, uh, in New York or around the world, but the way it was designed, the way it was designed to be manufactured was uh, completely different from what you get out of Detroit or, or Shanghai for that matter, or India, uh, China for that matter. So um, business model innovation, frugal innovation, these are very powerful things coming out of India now, uh, which should play uh, and could play a, a very large role in the evolution of IT from uh, sort of low value to high value. And um, let's see, what else is another example of this? Oh, yesterday, um, I've been associated with a conference, an uh, Indian conference out of Bangalore called Dream In. And it was put together by uh, what I consider one of the best innovation slash design consultancies in the world. It's called Idiom. Uh, here in the US, we're all very fond of a consul consultancy called IDEO. Uh, India has something called Idiom, um, which is wildly innovative. And they put on a conference uh, in Bangalore here yesterday as part of the Parsons um, Festival, in which they're presenting a whole different model. I call it DVC, uh, design-based venture capital, where uh, they uh, use design at very early stages of selecting possible uh, ideas, 
um, for uh, new products, new organizations, new NGOs, and bringing them along in various stages, uh, which should, um, has a possibility, you know, about 10% of new ideas uh, that are presented or that come up actually reach fruition in terms of a new company or a new organization. With this new framing of design-based venture capital, you could probably increase that from 10 to 20 or 10 to 50. That in itself uh, would quite revolutionize the entire um, venture capital business. It was a brilliant idea. It came out of Bangalore, came out of Idiom. And I think there is an awful lot of that happening now, uh, uh, an enormous amount coming out of India, new ideas, uh, new thoughts about uh, reframing uh, manufacturing, reframing retail, reframing all kinds of parts of the economy that should, again, have huge implications for IT. Um, one thing I, I would disagree with some of the panelists, uh, with the panelists, which is uh, I would continue to embrace uh, low value and low cost uh, IT. Uh, even as it, uh, in fact, I see it splitting this way. Um, uh, low cost, uh, low volume uh, IT has proved to be revolutionary in changing the economy and society of India, really. And I think uh, because of the demographics, because uh, there are so many young people uh, in India, and because uh, uh, outside the, I guess, I don't know what you call it, the tier one, tier two cities, or tier three cities, is that the, is the language? Um, there's a huge demand for uh, uh, for people to uh, you know move up the scale of mobility. This is a great way to do it. It's been proven in the larger cities in India uh, that this is a way to uh, bring you know upwardly mobile. It's also a way to charge the uh, local economies there. There are provinces uh, or states uh, and uh, areas in India where uh, becoming part of the IT industry is something uh, people really aspire to. Uh, there are bigger problems in moving outside the tier one, tier two cities. There's a language problem, uh, as, as described in the paper. Uh, there are other problems, there are education problems. But these are problems that India needs to solve anyhow. It needs to deal with this. Uh, and uh, by, by focusing uh, on low-cost IT and bringing it out of the major cities into more, uh, you know, tier two, tier three, tier four cities. This is a way of invigorating growth in those cities, in those regions. So I wouldn't walk away from it. Uh, I think uh, there's a great opportunity now to, do, you know, high value, high cost, and low value, low cost uh, in India. And that should, you know, both of those should be embraced. I think there, it would be good for India to do both of those things at the same time. Um, what else do I have to say? Um, in terms of education, uh, everyone is talking about uh, IT and education and trying to deliver education uh, in a different way. Um, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, Sam Petroda, who I'm not quite sure what his position in the government is now. Uh, a while back, he was involved in the deregulation of uh, you know, uh, uh, telecom and what have you. He was speaking uh, in Chicago, and he said, uh, you know, Bruce, you have a great education system here in the U.S. Uh, the only problem is uh, it's too expensive. You know, it's based on a one to 30 ratio, uh, professor or teacher, you know, 30 students. What we need in India and probably what you need in the U.S. is a one to 1,000 ratio. You've got to figure out how to deliver one to 1,000 in the same way, if not a better way. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, San Petrona has a way of framing things uh, that just that's, that's an incredible frame, and you work back from that. Uh, I, no one has delivered that yet. No one has really uh, delivered uh, a kind of system uh, that's beyond just throwing things down a pipe at people, which really doesn't work. But uh, it's, a great, uh, it's a great frontier, and uh, you know, whoever cracks that first is going to have an enormous industry. And uh, uh, there's a, a heck of a good chance that'll happen in India before it happens anywhere else. So um, those are my thoughts, and let's have a conversation. Okay, we uh, have uh, quite a bit of time for discussion, so I hope we can have a rather open-ended, free-flowing uh, discussion. Uh, perhaps I could uh, just pick up a theme of, uh, of Bruce uh, Nussbaum uh, and ask the panelists to to comment however they would like to. 
uh, a bit more on this. Um, uh, Professor Nussbaum mentioned uh, that he uh, had one slight area of disagreement with the other two panelists, that he would place perhaps, if I understood him correctly, less emphasis on uh, moving up the value chain uh, since uh, there was a, a social imperative to generate employment for which uh, uh, continuing uh, to have uh, quite a lot of economic activity in the low end of the value chain and in particular in those most labor absorbing segments of the IT industry would continue to be important. Uh, I recalled when I heard him make this remark, if I understood it correctly, uh, the uh, uh, observation of uh, Sanjay Alal, the uh, very eminent uh, Oxford heterodox development economist who died uh, a few years ago, uh, that many of the most successful newly industrializing countries, such as South Korea, uh, although they were perceived as moving up the ladder of technological capability, and in a certain respect they certainly did so, uh, never really moved out of producing the things that they were originally quite successful at producing at the lower rungs of that same ladder. So for example, South Korea remained a major exporter of garments, even as it had begun to produce cars and computers. Uh, and this was not widely remarked upon, but it was a very important uh, uh, reality of the world market for garments. Uh, South Korea, uh, of course, had to rely less on garment exports uh, as it began to diversify for its own uh, economic uh, prosperity and progress, uh, but it, it, it did remain a major, major player in that, in that field. And of course, in thinking about India or China or other uh, large um, economies with gigantic agrarian sectors, uh, which uh, are fairly unremunerative as compared to the, the uh, islands of prosperity, uh, such as the IT industry, um, one has to, of course, place central emphasis on this question of how people will be, uh, will be uh, absorbed into uh, more remunerative forms of employment or provided more remunerative forms of employment or perhaps uh, thinking even more generally uh, than employment, uh, more remunerative forms of livelihood. Uh, from this point of view, the focus on the IT industry, um, however important it has been, and it has been important, uh, for India's development in the last 25 years uh, seems to be uh, perhaps a little bit narrow. Uh, if one thinks about um, the question of what are the other booms, booming sectors in India, what occurs to me is that the other most prominent booming sector in India today is the, uh, 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 is the sector uh, of natural resources extraction. Mining, for example, much of it illegal. Uh, and uh, this is really uh, a kind of primitive accumulation which is taking place, uh, which in very many instances relies on subverting laws, uh, on uh, uh, exerting local political power, often in connivance with, uh, with uh, ruffians and thugs, in order to uh, extract resources and sell them either for domestic use or for foreign use. And, uh, uh, this is the very other. Uh, this, this is on the on, on the other end of a continuum, perhaps, uh, from that of the IT industry. The IT industry uh, involves um, a fairly privileged group of people creating, it would seem, certainly by their own self-description, uh, something out of nothing, uh, not particularly asking for handouts or supports uh, from uh, from the government. Uh, certainly, uh, their 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 formal discourse largely involves. Uh, the demand that government should get out of the way, whatever the history of governmental supports and the role of government as a catalyst in the IT industry, which is, of course, something that's, that's also interesting to discuss. Uh, and uh, 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 in contrast, the primitive accumulators uh, seem, to be, um, uh, have, seem to have a rather parasitic relationship to the, to the state and the society. Um, where India seems to have failed is is to find more examples of, of, uh, of sectors or of industries uh, which have some of the good features of IT, uh, but which can be uh, more successful at reaching the mass of people. Uh, so I wondered whether and how you would uh, all like to comment on this, perhaps uh, beginning with, um, with Ajit, if, if, if you would like to do so. Yeah, you know, it's easy to, 
yeah, it's easy to look at IT as a job provider, but look here are the statistics on it. Today, the IT industry, with all its tributaries, employs two million people, and the number of young people entering the job market in the next 15 years, you know what the number is? 395 million people. So it, it, it won't even you know, make a small dent on it, which is why most of us who are worried about these things in India are looking at IT not as a job provider, but as a tool which can help us bring education, and as Bruce correctly said, low-cost healthcare. There are some outstanding examples of that. Arvind High Hospital is a poster child for that. Uh, so use of IT not to, to save costs or create jobs, but to deliver services which till now we have not been able to deliver to large scale and with high quality. So a lot of my energy and time is going into that end of it. The reason I brought the Gandhiji story was, uh, you know, looking back today, that episode at Champaran, which Gandhi declared victory and moved on to his famous political life. In the end, what happened? The Germans, in seeking to, to synthesize indigo, unraveled the benzene ring. Using that knowledge, they created a whole chemical industry and then went on to create a pharmaceutical industry. Now, in other words, the early stage of an application with technology, it looks as if it is cost-reducing. But that's illusory. The cost reducing factor is soon left behind. And what really matters is what additional benefits it brings. For example, today in IT, the exciting work going on is in machine learning, which is almost, it's a frontier area, you know? And how you can use machine learning to uh, add a tool to make an averagely educated doctor or nurse diagnose things at the same skill level of a highly qualified person. Those are the things which may help, you know? Um, yeah, so I guess my, my sort of uh, point wasn't uh, so much as to that um, you know, the companies doing low value added, low cost services should abandon ship, but more so that, uh, you know, let's look at the projections and sort of look at um, decisions there, right? So uh, right now the, the Indian, uh, sort of the global um, outsourcing slash offshoring BPO industry is about $500 billion, uh, give or take a few percentage points. In the next 10 years, by 2020, it's supposed to grow up to about 1.5 to 1.6 trillion dollars in size. Okay. But 80% of that growth is going to come not from the existing verticals, but from the newer verticals. So the existing verticals where uh, a lot of the companies uh, from India or uh, the Philippines or China or Eastern Europe have focused on come from you know, retail, banking and financial services, manufacturing, um, and so on. But 80% uh, of the growth in the next 10 years is going to come from newer verticals, such as healthcare, mobile, uh, you know, uh, climate change, energy efficiency. So there's this, uh, you know, if you've been seeing uh, at least, uh, you know, one prime example that comes to my mind is IBM's Smarter Planet vision, right, which is that let's try and produce technologies that have or at least enable a lower carbon footprint. And um, so companies who are going to be providing the, the software to enable that, uh, that's, you know, that's at the very high end of value addition. So, so my sort of personal take is, you know, uh, it's not that we need to, uh, you know, go from uh, low, low cost to high value right away, but it should be, instead of being a revolutionary strategy, it should be evolutionary. Um, and sort of, you know, uh, partly, Going back to Sanjay's point, I was in South Korea actually in April. I spent two weeks there, uh, you know, working with different companies and so on. So it was interesting that you talked about that because, in fact, you know, that came up in our discussions too about how uh, South Korea has moved from, you know, the apparel and garment business to high-tech industries, computers, cars, uh, electronics uh, has actually not been um, revolutionary, rather, rather, rather very, uh, has been revolutionary, not evolutionary, in the sense that. Uh, you know, they decided to take it uh, gradually based on various government incentives that was uh, periodically infused in the system. Um, so, you know, so I guess my point is uh, that so I see 80% of the growth coming from the newer verticals, um, so there's more, um, you know, potential there, but um, so we should make the move gradually, uh, not overnight. So I guess that was my point. Sure. I think basically we're all kind of 80% agreement or 90% agreement. Yeah. Uh, 
I think, um, let's see if I could, what would be an interesting point to make? Um, I think an interesting point to make uh, would be to uh, try and turn around and see what uh, each of our cultures is good at. Um, and um, uh, it's uh, clear to me as an outsider, uh, just looking in, at, at India, uh, India is a, a, a co uh, in terms of the, its economy, uh, is a, in many ways a culture of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and uh, more so that uh, than a culture of uh, mass production. Uh, and it has all kinds of you know, reasons. Uh, um, it, it, I guess in some ways you could all say the same thing about the US. Uh, entrepreneurs, innovation seems to be very much part of that culture. Um, and uh, those are huge strengths. And I see, um, in terms of IT, just in terms of economic growth, that's really the great potential for, for India to come up with new kinds of ways of doing new things, or new kinds of ways of doing old things. And given the enormous market within India, it's got a great base to, to start this out, and then to face forward and uh, you know, export it. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, GE uh, makes this enormous big deal about uh, one product it developed in India. I think it's a portable x-ray machine or something like that, uh, in which uh, they developed it for the Indian market, uh, very inexpensive, simple, right? And now they're going to bring it back to the U.S. And um, they make a very big deal about it because I think it changes the frame of how they see uh, manufacturing and R&D and, uh, and, and areas where they can go to learn how to be innovative in an innovative way. And I think uh, that's really going to be the strength of India, if it can release that in a, in a scale. So far, we've seen lots of small examples uh, in healthcare, but we haven't seen that scaled yet. And I think that's huge potential for IT. These things have to be scaled. Same thing in manufacturing with the nano. Uh, where we've seen scale is in mobile uh, cell phone technology used in retail and various other things. That, that's, in many ways, that's really revolutionized parts of agriculture and parts of the village life. So um, that's where I, I see, and plus the connection of, if it happens, the diaspora Indians out of Silicon Valley and elsewhere doing more in India in terms of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. I think that's really huge, you know, uh, huge potential. So, but at the same time, uh, getting back to low value, um, there are many Indias, uh, just like there are many, you know, many Americas. And there are parts of India that uh, could hugely value uh, low, low cost, low value IT still. Uh, and in as much as the infrastructure, the mentality, the management, culture has been built up over the years if it can, in fact, be transferred out of the areas it is now. Uh, it makes huge sense to do that, especially since so many, you know, uh, so many young people w aspire to that already. Uh, it's not something that, you know, they want to do it. It should be enabled, uh, if only for their own upward mobility, but for the, the growth in those various, you know, regions away from the major cities, so. Thank you. Um, and uh, before I invite uh, questions, I would also like to say that perhaps it would be interesting to connect uh, the discussion uh, to the uh, larger theme of the conference, India's world. It's hard to think of a sector which is more thoroughly globalized than the IT sector, in, 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 generally, and it's certainly yeah. in India. As all of you know, this is evinced in sm large and small ways, including the, the fact that uh, many of the rank and file who work in the IT sector work very strange schedules so that they can be in touch with clients in America, uh, primarily, which is a, remains the major market, even though increasingly there's diversification toward Europe and other other markets. Um, I, I um, am reminded in thinking of this of a story I read uh, just the other day about Gandhi's uh, um, uh, first. Um, uh, well, Gandhi's trip to uh, initial uh, uh, voyage to uh, 
to uh, England to study. Uh, his, uh, his family, his immediate family, had supported him in this decision and had raised funds for him to do so. But when he went to Bombay to go over to London, uh, he faced strong opposition from members of his immediate uh, caste group in Bombay. Uh, because it would involve crossing the black waters, which would mean a loss of caste status. Of course, there were many Gujaratis living in, uh, in Africa, and uh, uh, many others had also previously gone to England and so on. But nevertheless, there remained a very strong prohibition, and in his very uh, conservative uh, 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 caste and family circle in Bombay, there was very substantial opposition to this. And uh, ultimately, his brother-in-law, who, who lived in Bombay and had been tasked with uh, with um, giving him the money for the uh, voyage, refused to do so because uh, a caste panchayat had passed a resolution that anyone who helped Gandhi to go over to London would uh, also be in violation of their strictures and would be excommunicated in effect. Uh, and uh, this, can, this, uh, this was dealt with then by, by Gandhi resorting to a financial innovation, as we would now call it. Uh, which is that he borrowed the money from a third party who was then paid back by the brother-in-law so that the brother-in-law could claim that he had not directly aided Gandhi, though that was, of course, only in the letter uh, and, uh, uh, rather than in the spirit of the, of, uh, of the law. Uh, that story really exemplifies uh, to me the, the uh, extent to which it's not really possible uh, to think uh, of... Um, uh, about anything in India today in narrowly uh, national terms, even though uh, India obviously has a subcontinental-sized polity with, and economy, uh, which uh, in many respects is still not integrated very substantially with the world. Uh, all of the things that matter in India uh, do nevertheless involve very substantial causal interactions with the world and the way in which the world thinks of India and India thinks about the world are, uh, uh, are both important to confront in order to understand each. So uh, the floor is open to anyone who would like to comment, raise questions, rebel generally. Can I? Please. Yeah, my question is uh, to Mr. Balakrishnan. Uh, before that, I would just throw in an aside. I'm an avid reader of India Abroad, and I've been reading it uh, since long before you took over. And uh, the paper has considerably improved after you took over, just a compliment. Uh, then uh, my question has to do with the growth of IT industry that you have mentioned, a very beautiful narration. And to a computer semi-literate like me, that historical origin was very fascinating. I'm learning it for the first time. Uh, the growth you mentioned, to what extent it has to do with the switch in policy the government of India adopted, more specifically from socialism to uh, free market economy. And uh, to give credit to one individual, more specifically for the, to the reforms put in place by the then finance minister Manmohan Singh and today's prime minister, that economic policy doesn't it have it has to do a lot, I, I think. You know, uh, before coming to the India answer, I once saw a debate between Mrs. Thatcher, uh, Gorbachev, and I think it was George Bush, the father. And they asked Gorbachev, why did you launch Glasnost? And um, there were some people, including Mrs. Thatcher, who said, you know, freedom, revolution, etc. But Gorbachev's answer was that Russian elite wanted it to happen. They were ready to give up. They saw more benefits under a Glasnost scheme than under the Indian regime. And I think some of that, some of us in India, not all, think that what happened in 91, where the economy liberated itself, was largely because the, the English-speaking elite had got as much as they could under a socialistic regime. So they saw a better deal that they would get now by opening the markets. So I think this is a kind of a new institutional argument on why this happened. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think they saw that, uh, uh, you must remember the politics of India through the 70s and 80s, 
There was a rising regional groups which were winning in, first in Tamil Nadu, uh, later in Bihar. So the embattled elite now needed foreign partners to exist. So that's about it. So I think it is a self-serving decision of the Indian elite to, to save themselves, so to speak. That is a very popular view among Indian thinkers today. Thank you. So on the other side, you could argue that uh, uh, the US economic elite uh, saw in globalization a way to maintain, if not increase, uh, profits, revenues, position in society. Very interesting. I think there's one microphone on this side and one on this side, so please feel free to come to either. Well, I um, love the historical background <clears throat> from Ajit Balakrishnan's talk, and as a historian, I appreciated things I'd never understood before. I also love the etymology of algorithm. This is Wendy Doniger. Oh, sorry. Wait, I'm, I'm a Sanskritist and not an economist, so I could only find certain pieces that I could uh, really respond to, but I particularly like the the uh, etymology of algorithm, which I thought was fascinating. What interested me really also in uh, Nindya Ghosh's response was, uh, and also Bruce Nussbaum, was the question of education and the enormous task of educating and the idea of one teacher to a thousand um, is uh, uh, astonishing to me and really challenging. So my question to you really is about the use of social networks in this revolutionary kind of education that's going to have to take place. Again, India is leading the world. We, too, are having trouble finding teachers per students in our own institutions in America. And I'm worried about the idea of education as data-based, the idea that all that you learned after college was what you needed because there were no computers. But what you learned in college to become the man you are now was how to use knowledge, how to find knowledge, how to evaluate knowledge, how to judge what's likely to be good and what's not. Um, and I wonder whether that can be done through social media. Social media, to that extent, is the problem rather than the solution. You, you get something from Wikipedia, but is it right? And how do you find out whether the person who speaks has a political viewpoint that's influencing her or knows what she's talking about and so forth? So my question then is, with the use of social media, how can you still do the kind of education that you did get before computers were invented that showed you how to pick up immediately the minute you saw a computer and decide what to do with it? Um, so that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, um, so, um, you know, so, so different people have different viewpoints on this. And I guess uh, my viewpoint with uh, on social media or social networks has been that um, one of the things that I see between uh, the you know, times that I've actually used in the class, is going back last three or four years versus when these things were not around, is that it actually encouraged and sim stimulated more active class in-class discussions. Um, of course, you know, I can't generalize. Every course is different. Um, and I, I would see differences even within the two courses, one, one course which is very quantitative, whereas one that's actually more strategic. So the courses that are more strategically oriented would actually see a lot more liveliness in class, partially because, as you said, you know, um, so, so let's say as, as a professor I explain a concept and somebody uh, can, you know, let's say, seemingly look it up from Wikipedia or Newpedia, and then he or she can actually disagree with me, and then that would actually lead to a very lively debate. Okay? So, um, so again, this is one example, but I've seen, you know, sort of, um, at least in the last three or four years, the liveliness in the classroom becoming more salient now. The other thing is that um, I've sort of also taken away that rather than teaching being just a one-way interaction between me as a professor and, you know, the other 100 students, um, the advent and the adoption of social media has actually made it two-way, in the sense that I have actually gone back and thought often about you know, some of the debates you've had, and every now and then I would change my position on that, because now I'm more informed. And so I think of social media as one that enables people to harness the wisdom of the crowds. Okay? Earlier it used to be just one brain that I have, and now I actually have you know, 100 students and harnessing their wisdom collectively, and informing me as I go along. 
So, um, you know, so I, I sort of see more positives than sort of, uh, and I'm sure there are flip sides and I can talk about the negatives too. Right. Uh, <laughs> there's the noise of the crowds as well. Uh, but all else equal, I sort of see more positives than negatives. And, um, you know, there's the several other examples I can talk about, you know, uh, and, but I'll, I'll see what the other panelists have to say. You know, um, I go back again to my chemistry analogy. I think social media roughly is where chemistry was in 1890s. They had synthesized indigo, but did not know how that happened. The benzene bond had, you know, had not been unraveled. So today we have uh, financial successes such as Facebook and Twitter and other things, but really um, the underlying pieces, how collective intelligence is statistically inferred from, a lot of it is statistical analysis. There is no magic if you come <laughs> from that kind of background. But I think the, only the, the early beginnings, like the synthesis of indigo just solved one problem which is to substitute indigo coming from India. Uh, but the, really break, the real breakthroughs came when once the benzene bond was unraveled, and then he could use that to synthesize a large number of other things. They attacked quinine next. That was the next big project given. But that was, again, a natural substitution. But then it went on to pharmaceutical. So that process lies ahead. So what we've seen of social media, I think, is the very beginning. Uh, the real actions will start, I think, in about seven to ten years from now, according to me. I agree with you. Um, I would also like to go on record and say that I think education uh, should be expensive. And uh, there's a reason why wealthy people spend fortunes of money educating their children. They get great educations. Uh, there's a reason why classes in private schools or uh, pre, you know, pre-kindergarten schools here in Manhattan uh, have very small ratios. There's a reason for that, and uh, the kind of knowledge that you get from interacting and engaging this way, and also this way, uh, is hugely valuable. And so uh, I think we should be paying our teachers what you know the Japanese pay their teachers, or the Finns pay their teachers, or uh, what the Chinese pay their teachers in Shanghai and Beijing, which is pretty much twice what we pay them now. Uh, and uh, we should be spending more money on education. I see social media as not a way of lowering the cost, but of improving uh, the delivery of education. And we use a lot of it uh, in, uh, in Parsons as, in many ways, a social algorithm uh, where people are connecting you to things that they have seen, uh, articles they've seen or videos they've seen. Uh, and uh, they're connecting to each other in terms of, uh, you know, how much learning goes on uh, among students as opposed to, you know, and that's all very valuable. But it's very primitive. I mean, uh, University of Phoenix, which is always held up here in the U.S. as a great example, is, uh, uh, you know, under investigation for criminal behavior. Uh, 50, 80 percent of the students drop out every year. Most of the money comes from government loans. Most of the people are military. It's, you know, it's a joke. So what we have now uh, is not, you know, by any means what we really need to have and what we'll probably have in a few years from now. Uh, if you've seen some of the technologies like telepresence, uh, which is sort of Skype, but a million times better, and it really delivers this uh, immediate emotional uh, content over, you know, over long distances, that has enormous potential to to provide social media you know, in context with other things uh, uh, in a different way. So, um, so that's what I think. So, uh, so it's also sort of worth, uh, you know, uh, just one minor point, what's the distinguishing between uh, distance learning and the use of social media in the classroom? So uh, just you know, uh, sort of echo uh, Bruce's point. Um, I am uh, sort of uh, I can go on record and say I'm a big fan of the use of social media in the classroom, not as a substitute for teaching, but as a complement to it. Uh, whereas distance learning now that has you know a lot more um, you know the, the way more flip sides to that than and that. So just want to be clear that what I'm saying. Do you have a question? Yes, I know, but Professor Padra is waiting, and he's a distinguished gentleman, but I think this yes, gentleman yes, whom I don't know is already longer. waiting, so would you please introduce yourself? Thank you. 
Me? You. You. Yes, oh. you. <laughs> if you don't uh, mind. My, my name is Kevin Novell, and I'm, I have one rebuke and two questions, and I, I'm coming from, uh, and these are informed from four years in uh, the IT sector basically doing uh, human information interface. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, four years hu human information interface. Uh, uh, the remark that Professor Reddy made about um, the hours that uh, Indian technology workers, the, the odd hours Indian technology workers have, I feel like that many that IT workers pretty much everywhere keep crazy hours. <laughs> um, the questions that I have, uh, the first is um, in, in sort of piggybacking off of, off of what you were concerned about with um, the, um, the use of social media. Um, I, I was wondering in, in your experiences with it if um, the there's been any disparities within the groups of or within your classes of students that know the technology, understand its limitations, sort of understand the underlying architecture of what uh, the tool can do and what the tool uh, is structured not to allow. Um, and the, the second question I have is uh, around um, spatially based innovation and entrepreneurship. The, the model that I've always seen I hyped in the US is um, the uh, private university consortium um, model, uh, the Silicon Valley uh, Research Triangle Park. Uh, where the university has had spin-offs, and um, I was wondering if um, entrepreneurship worked in the same sort of clustering area, and if so, w if it worked with those private universities that sound sort of problematic. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I, I can start with the first question. Um, so, you know, my first uh, use of social media in the classroom goes back to 2006. Um, this is when, um, you know, uh, there was more MySpace and less Facebook. So if you know the history of social networking sites, uh, MySpace was huge then. Facebook was just about up and coming. People knew of it when they're quite clear about the differences. So I sort of uh, wanted to make sure that we stay away from social networking sites, but rather instead use social media tools like blogs and wikis. Okay, that was my first foray in this space. And so sure enough, you know, in 2006, this was a very new concept. Uh, even, even I was on the learning frontier myself. Um, but over the last few years, I've seen that uh, you know, the uh, students who come into class are far better equipped knowing the nuances of these technologies, and so the adoption rate is much faster. And so it, uh, my initial reaction from students in the 2006, 2007 years were more skepticism, what is this, or sort of, why do we need this? Uh, why do we need so much transparency? Because one of the things the social media does, it, it makes everybody's answers transparent, or it sort of at least gives everybody in the class a sense for how good or how not so good somebody is. Okay. Um, but over the last few years, things have been um, a lot more easier. Um, but then, you know, every now and then, like in 2009, I started the use of Twitter in the classroom. And again, this was the early days of Twitter, and people were, no, most students were aware of it, but very few actually had Twitter accounts. And this goes to both MBAs and undergrads that I've taught. Um, so my, my first day in class, I actually sort of, uh, in some ways, institutionalized the practice by giving them a sense for uh, why this could actually help. So, you know, we, um, so as I said initially in my remarks, that there was a fair bit of skepticism when people said, is this a substitute to my asking questions to you in the class? And I wanted to make it clear that it wasn't the case at all. And in fact, in many ways, people who are hesitant to ask questions in the classroom are, could use this as a tool to ask me questions later on. Okay. 
And if you didn't still want to disclose who you are, you can ask these things anonymously. So in wikis and blogs, you, know, you can enable these sort of things. And um, so you know, based on the course, if the course involved a fair bit of discussion, case studies or strategic discussions, I saw that the use of these tools uh, you know, significantly richened the discussion in class. And it sort of, it made a real joy for me to go walk into class every morning and say, all right, guys, let's do this. You know, that's, um, um, and I would see you know, discussion, uh, people, the number of people who would actively participate in class go from 10% you know, to like 40, 50%. So, um, you know, so, not, so and, and to summarize the question, um, I've seen the adoption rate of these technologies increasing and exponentially. Um, there are a lot of the students who now come into school are sort of, you know, they were kind of, this is the bread and butter, they've been doing this for a while. Um, but I, I spend a fair bit of time on the first day explaining the nuances of each of these to make sure that they understand what they are sort of getting into. You know, it's one thing to write on somebody's wall on Facebook, and another thing to contribute to a class discussion in a group page on Facebook and so on. And, um, you know, and, and so I also actually make sure that, um, you know, we, we, um, the class participation in social media also counts towards your scores. So, um, for example, in many of the courses, we've got class participation scores. And um, earlier, it used to be the case that only 5% of the students would participate. There'd be four or five people who were very vocal, and they'd be sort of hogging all the discussion. And the remaining 95% may have had smarter points to make, but they would actually be feeling left out. Whereas what now it happens is with the use of social media, even the remaining 95% can participate. And I can hear them, and they can hear us. So, uh, this is one of the ways where I've seen, uh, you know, the benefits of these things. Um, and, but, you know, make no mistake, and going back to Wendy's and Bruce's point, this is, uh, to it's to be a supplement. It's not, uh, it's not substituting its complement to what we're doing in the class. Um, yeah, Sandy, go ahead. You know, I thought I heard a question about where this locus of innovation is likely to be. And, you know, it's worth going back to the famous, uh, you know, Larry Page, Sergey Brin paper, uh, some of you, and only computer nerds like me read these things, uh, which started off Google, the original academic paper, which was a doctoral dissertation. And you'll notice one or two things. First, they pay credit to saying thank you for all the people who funded the Digital Libraries Project. So obviously the Digital Libraries Project from the early 90s going on, wanting to take an old institution like an American college library and then bring it into the modern world. The second piece, the real breakthrough, what they achieved was, instead of having human editors look to see which were the good sites to go to, they borrowed an idea very much from American academia, which is like, what if all of you do that? You see a paper and count how many others have cited it, right? And then the more people cite it, it's a better paper. You've known that since, I think, since the days of the German universities. So, the breakthrough that the Google kids did was exactly this. They said, instead of having human people read this, let's just count the number of backlinks. That was the doctoral dissertation and the foundation of Google. Now, what do we learn from this? That a, a well-known idea, which is to ch check backlinks or, or citations, number of citations, and that too, citations come from well-known others, well-cited journals, even better. All of you knew that, I think, since I, my guess is still about 1905 or 1906. So they used an algorithm to automate that process. So today the challenge in using social media and education is really to go and see what do good teachers do and find a way to take some of that and code it into an algorithm. That's really where the breakthrough is going to come from, in my view. Professor Padrai, who's the guest editor of the journal issue around which this conference yeah, thanks, is Thanks, Thanks to all of you um, for these uh, terrific presentations and especially to Ajit for both the paper and the very concise presentation of that very rich paper uh, this morning. Uh, there's a lot on, on the table uh, and the discussion has made evident uh, quite a few of the issues. I'm sure there are others still to come. Uh, I'm still groping to formulate uh, the question in my mind, uh, and the key words are uh, information, uh, in my mind, information, literacy, because it goes to the whole education question, and innovation, what Ajit just talked about, 
And here's what I'm trying to think about, and perhaps you can clarify the question as well as uh, Ajit particularly, but I hope any of you and all of you might want to respond. In my mind, uh, when I think of inform the IT revolution, the story that Ajit describes in the paper, it's a particular moment in the history of information which is clearly much older. The information is as far back as you want to go. Right? Writing, et cetera, et cetera. Recording of any type, documentation. Uh, it's a history that you can uh, trace back thousands of years, if not in some cases longer. So clearly it's a recent crucial <clears throat> change. And my question is, thinking about a place like India, the social issues that you've all presented, <clears throat> Ajit's uh, a pointed statistic about 2 million jobs in relation to 395 million, that it is not a job issue as such. Uh, thinking about all that, I'm wondering if you can help us, those of us who are not inside the machinery of recent IT, what the new relationship is to literacy, potentially, in IT. And what I mean by that is, there's a literacy problem that all education policy has been about anyway. You know, Pratham and this and that increased literacy, meaning all kinds of things by it. My, my question is, is there going to be a new relationship, or is, could there be a new relationship of literacy as a consequence of this revolution, the IT revolution? And the interest I have has two features. One has to do with innovation and one its context. One is, will there be a new form of literacy because of this revolution? such that the nature, climate, and environs of innovation itself will change. If not, we'll have the same story, but with some new technological bells and whistles. And the more pointed version of that, for me, is will the context, culture, possibility of innovation, say of the Google type or of any other type, widen dramatically? Because to me, the history of literacy, innovation, et cetera, in a place like India, or really anywhere, is basically it comes out of a small group. It doesn't matter what, whether it's a writing technology or some other technology or a typing technology or a phoning technology. A small group that basically defines in the rest, uh, and here it seems to be the IT revolution, very similar, BPO and all that, they are knowledge fodder. Today I have to learn Java, tomorrow Java is not required, I learned something else. In other words, I'm not a driver, I'm not a shaper, I'm not an innovator, I'm not even a particular consumer. I'm just a guy who's told work on this lathe, you know, don't learn COBOL anymore, learn X or do this and that. So could that change uh, with this new form of information technology, if indeed it is new in a radical way, that is not just in the obvious way. So this is the broad question. Will the conditions of literacy change as a consequence of this technological revolution so that the class of innovators, the conditions of innovation, and in my mind of participation, will change? And you won't just have an army anyway that's going to be knowledge for the, except the knowledge is somewhat new. Uh, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I wouldn't associate uh, innovation with learning computer languages at all. I think that's just a simple tool. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the co-founders of uh, both PayPal and YouTube, um, what's his name? It's the white guy, not the Chinese-American guy. Uh, anyhow, he went to, uh, he went to uh, Carnegie Mellon University, um, and he went there uh, to get a computer science degree. And uh, he always had a, an interest in art. And uh, when he was there, he, he flipped it. He said, uh, well, you know, what I'm really interested in is designing things, and uh, the computer is a, just a great tool. So um, he did that, and then he went on to create and innovate, uh, both PayPal, which was revolutionary in terms of retail, and, uh, or buying online, and then YouTube, which was quite revolutionary in terms of people being able to post their own creations, videos, uh, online. And um, I think uh, writing basically is one of many literacies. Uh, I have to tell you here at Parsons, or there at Parsons, sorry, I'm, I'm at Parsons. Um, um, the students have incredible visual literacy. 
you know, this week, last week, next week, we're seeing the results of their senior projects uh, and other projects, and they're marvelous. They're incredible, uh, and they're all full of spelling mistakes. Uh, and it doesn't really matter, uh, depending on which generation you're in. The professors really get, you know, very uptight about it, and their parents just pull their hair out. But within their own cohort, you know, what's really important is the presentation mm -hmm. and the communication. Uh, and they do it in a, you know, uh, less of a written way than in others. But they're incredibly creative um, and innovative. And the reason why they're creative and innovative uh, is not because they have this or that. They have learned uh, what I would call uh, the literacies of creativity. Uh, the behaviors of creativity. That's something that they really get out of uh, Parsons. And I think uh, you see a lot of that coming out of India. Uh, I don't know how it's done. Frankly, I don't even know how it's done at Parsons. Uh, but clearly they're learning it. Clearly they're being taught that. And I think that's the nature of innovation, uh, you know, with an uppercase. Uh, Bruce, could I just I, uh, press that point, given your yeah. response? I very much want to hear Ajit and Anandu as well and Sanjay. But uh, in a conversational spirit to say, I think you're, you're putting your finger on something very important, so, which allows me to sharpen my question slightly. All these things, going back to writing and possibly to linguistic exchange itself, prior to writing, talking, <laughs> you know, uh, when language emerged and so on, all of them are tools. That's not the issue. Fire is a tool as well. The question is, is this tool going to change the conditions of the relationship between literacy, innovation, so on, democratize it, for example, which is my big interest. Can we take a high-end activity from the German Research University and make it available to 10,000 youth in Bombay? That's my practical concern. So these things are all tools. Some tools are good, some tools are not good. But the question is, is this generically a different tool in regard to So, So I'm with you completely about the tool part. But I'm thinking, is this a tool? Uh, you know, people like McLuhan and other lesser known people, Ong and so on, have said that when literacy arrives, things change. In other words, your whole configuration changes. But that's not such an easy thing to show. And, and uh, over time, uh, with technologies of different kinds, technologies of knowledge, let's say, uh, it's not evident that basically they change the right and left side of the brain or change the nature of poetry, this, that, which is fine. But I'm asking whether here there is some other potential to reconfigure, not the hard wiring of the brain, but the social conditions under which innovation is produced. That, that's what I'm pushing on, but yeah, I think. You know, uh, I think there exists uh, dramatic possibilities, and some people are trying it as well. Uh, look back to, I used the term Fordist in one of my slides, and I didn't get any provocated answers on that. But what I meant was manufacturing during that era everywhere in the world, Mr. Ford invented it, was workers do something and then gatekeepers, quality control people, check and drop some things out, you know? Or these 10 parts, you know, go drop it. So it's a series of uh, elimination of defects, defective pieces. Mm -hmm. The current education system works exactly like that. We administer tests at the entry point, then we test at every uh, class. Uh, you test to exit from school, you test to enter college and so on. That is the fundamental wastage. And who should we look to to find an answer? None other than Dr. Deming. Deming is the person who looked at it and said, you don't need to do that. Quality is free. If you remember, I, I, I don't know whether anybody remembers Dr. Deming in America anymore. But you know, his point was look at that piece and through providing information to that worker on what is right or wrong with the work that he's done and through constant discussion, make sure that 100% of the parts go through. So the goal of education has to be that if 100 people enter primary school, all 100 exit at the end by progressively making use of the ideas that Dr. Deming came and used in and created you know, in the, in the Japanese motor car industry. I think we need to kind of reinvent Deming and bring him back into the education system very badly in my view. Um, so, so let me uh, sort of start by giving an example from India. And, uh, so this goes back to you know sort of the role of technology in education, um, you know, and then I'll, uh, I'll sort of take it global and see. So um, I don't know how many of us in the room know of this um, uh, product called Shaksat. Um, does anybody know Shaksat? Right. So in 2009, towards the year end of the year, uh, the government of India, the Ministry of Education. 
uh, brought forward a new initiative uh, about a really low cost, very affordable tablet PC in India. Uh, if you think about you know, uh, tablet PCs here, you know, iPad or you know, if you can call that a tablet PC, but anything of that sort costs at least $1,000, maybe more, right? Now, that's you know, unimaginable for the average person in India to buy. So um, the government of India issued a tender and HCL Infosystems, uh, you know, one of the largest IT uh, services company in, in India and now in the world, won the tender. And they brought forward a product that is now being sold at $35. This is a $35 tablet PC being sold in India. And so uh, when I first read about it, I was like, really? Is that even feasible? Is that possible? What's inside it? Okay. And so um, the reason is because there's this huge concern about the digital divide in India. Okay. You know, how do we actually enable uh, computers and IT and the internet and laptops to uh, you know, minimize that divide? How do we cross that divide using these technologies? And that goes back to the question about social impact of IT. And so uh, and this has been sort of on the top of the mind of the, the bureaucrats and the politicians and people who make decisions for a while. And so they thought about this tablet PC and it's so info system now uh, sort of in the process of you know, uh, selling it. And um, the next, uh, and the other things they have done is they've also opened up an online portal uh, that is linked to your tablet PC where you can now, so the average person, so if I am a, you know, a reasonably educated person in, in some uh, you know, suburbs or maybe even the villages in India, as long as I know how to sort of type in www.shaksa.com, I can go to an online portal I can actually get free education. Okay? So there are uh, you know, eminent professors, teachers from across universities and, school and colleges and schools who have sort of enlisted themselves as experts in a certain field. And if I have a question about physics or chemistry or history or geography, I can go to Shaksat. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not in a school, right? So I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, you know, small time, small town uh, person, or maybe a villager. But I do know to how to access the internet. I've got a $35 tablet with me. I can go to Shaksat and figure out the answers to my questions. Of course, it's not a replacement for education, but you know, we've come a long way, uh, um, you know, in towards sort of bridging this digital divide. So, and, uh, and you know, there are several, several such examples I can talk about, but I thought this was pertinent to your question about how technology can be used to address larger social concerns. Um, and then sort of taking it globally, I think one, uh, and I talked about this earlier before, which is this issue of, uh, you know, the next verticals where we're going to be seeing the, uh, the use of technology more efficiently is climate change, uh, lower carbon footprints, energy efficiency. You know, uh, again, uh, this was uh, news to me when I first read it last year. Uh, to manufacture one pair of jeans, it takes six tons of water. Okay? Six tons of water to manufacture one pair of jeans. And if you go back to this notion of you know, uh, the scarcity of water, and in the next 20 years, 40% of the world uh, will have uh, less than 50% of the water they need. Okay? And that's a stark number. And so there are these companies in, in, in the high-tech area, spearheaded primarily by IBM, who are sort of working actively to use technology to address these social issues. Uh, with the water and energy nexus is another thing. It takes uh, 140 tons of water to produce one megawatt of power using natural gas. And so, you know, this is a trade-off. You know, if you want to produce more natural gas and energy, you've got to have more water, but you don't. And so this is where technology comes in, and so there's this massive sort of you know, focus towards uh, more carbon-friendly data centers. You know, Google spends, uh, consumes 3% of the world's energy uh, because of, they have these huge server farms, uh, but you need water to cool, or you, know, you need cooling agents. And so there's this focus now towards using technology to address larger social problems. Um, so I, you know, I think- So let me just say one last thing, just a comment. It's not a question. Uh, I don't want to hog the discussion by any means, but just to sharpen my point, I'll put it in the most stark way. Is there a possibility that this new information technology of the last 30 years, let's say, the story that Ajit tells, does it have a chance, not of doing all these things where I think the chances are perfectly reasonable, good, I'm totally open, in a nation of 1.2 billion, of increasing significantly the number of innovators? That's the narrow question. So I, I'll leave it there for our further conversation. But that's what I mean, not will it be good for solving other social issues, surely. But 
will that category change? That has everything to do with benzene ring, German research university. That all has to do with some ratios of where innovation occurs. My question is, in this stuff, could that number change? Not of the beneficiaries, general users. That, that's all clear. So anyway, just to clarify my question, but thanks very much for these. Can I make a stab at commenting on that? Because um, I think it's a fascinating question, and I think it has relevance to everybody on the globe. And uh, I'm going to say yes. And uh, I'll base it on the ex my own experience here in the US with our Gen Y generation, our students here. I think the, de the, the democratization of the tools of innovation, uh, basically via Apple, uh, has uh, really changed the face of innovation in the US. We have a generation now that we're teaching that grew up uh, uh, learning how to make little videos, learning how to visualize, learning how to iterate, learning how to do all the things that have to do with innovation and creativity. And they do it naturally. Uh, and uh, more and more of them are doing it. It's not just an elite group of people in various laboratories. You have a, in, basically an entire generation able to do the things that very few people were able to do before. And they started by you know, stealing music. And they, they have a remix culture. Well, remix is an interesting frame. You could talk about remix in terms of innovation and creativity. That's you know, bringing two things together. Uh, and I think it's part of their culture. And I think it's hugely uh, positive for us. Secondly, cities are uh, you know, cultures of creativity. Congestion, crowding. Uh, is you know uh, a very important part of innovation and creativity, and we're becoming more and more urban around the planet, uh, certainly in India. So I think those are at least two trends that would and make us more hopeful about the future. Uh, so one last example, going by now that I understand your question more precisely, is uh, there's a company called Innocentive. Um, some of us may know of this, but here's what they do. So, um, suppose I am Procter and Gamble, or I'm Rand Baxi, okay, and I have this, uh, you know, major problem that my in-house scientists have not been able to solve. What Innocentive does is that it acts as an intermediary between a company like Procter and Gamble and the rest of the world's R&D talent pool. Okay? If I am a researcher who has a degree in chemistry and I know I can at least try and address some problem, I can actually log into an incentive okay, from you know, Timbuktu and try and tackle that problem. So in that sense, uh, you know, an incentive is an internet-based intermediary, but this is where you see the power of the internet in you know, expanding innovation, the capabilities. If I could just comment briefly on this, abusing my position. Uh, there was a very interesting book by um, an economist named Julian Simon, which you would know, uh, called The Ultimate Resource, where he responded to the 1970s pessimism about, neo-Malthusian pessimism about the adequacy of the world's resources. And his point was, of course, that uh, every single person is a potential creator. And if individual persons are equipped, minimally or adequately equipped, to be uh, effective creators, then that can unleash uh, whole new frontier of, uh, of, of material uh, productivity, uh, which can enable societies which seem resource constrained to overcome their resource constraint. And this idea was, of course, picked up by the so-called new growth theorists, who did a whole bunch of uh, mathematical formalizations of this, this idea, people like Paul Romer and others. Uh, the, the bottom line of which, or the main point of which, is that growth need never end, according to these models unlike the earlier models in which growth eventually comes to an end because of the exhaustion of technological possibilities. And the main reason it never comes to an end is that human beings are creators. Uh, the point which that tradition seems to have, if we can call it a tradition because it's fairly recent, seems to have, however, missed in light of social media is that it matters not only that individual persons are adequately equipped, provided with the relevant elementary capabilities, as Amartya Sen would say, but that they also have to be connected <laughs> in ways that enable them to be productive collectively. And this, it seems to me, is a very valuable uh, 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 focus, which is introduced by social media to us. I also wonder, speaking rather speculatively here and, and uh, you know, verging rather far afield from our, our India-centric topic, 
whether we could not uh, uh, think by way of analogy to um, some existing concepts, for example, money. In, the, in, in monetary economics, uh, one of the central ideas is that of the velocity of money, the speed at which money circulates. It seems to me that one of the things that um, IT in general has done and that social media has certainly done is to bring about an increase in the velocity of information. But it's also it brought about an, a, a, a different kind of a qualitative change. In monetary economics, there are different concepts of what money is, ranging from what's called narrow money to broad money. So narrow money, for example, might, be, might involve uh, uh, things that we can explicitly recognize as money, such as cash that's in one's wallet or one's purse, whereas a broader concept of money would include, for example, checking accounts and other things that serve in a money-like fashion, whether or not they, they, you would at first recognize them as money. And uh, similarly, it seems to me that, uh, that the platforms, as, as the platforms through which information is uh, disseminated have expanded and become more various, we also have uh, uh, broader understandings of what information is and correlatively what literacy is, uh, which is, of course, a very significant suggestion of Professor Abadurai that we should, and, and followed up by Professor Nussbaum, that we need to rethink and understand what, understand differently uh, what literacy may be in, in such a setting. And of course, in this moment, we can't but think of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the revolutions that have swept the Arab world, if one wants to call them those, call them revolutions, uh, recently, and also, of course, other, um, other societies in the last two decades, which have, to varying degrees, depended on new media, and, and very recently, on, in particular, on social media, which seems to have the ability to jump over boundaries, to, 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 to uh, echo Deming, uh, to, to, to allow information to be free uh, in the way that, um, uh, in, in ways that it may not have otherwise been. And um, we have I, an I know example that, of China, which is just the opposite. Yes, of course, uh, and that, that we, 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 of course, uh, have to keep in mind. I know that Suvir Kaul had a question, uh, but he is, uh, since he's sitting in his seat, I think uh, we'll, we'll start here on the left. Hi, my name is Ruth Kavish. And this is a much more mundane question, and it relates to the gap between um, education and wealth of the rich and the poor in India. I was in Tamil Nadu, a small town, for a couple of months, a couple of years ago, and it was my understanding, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my understanding that local laws required um, for the poor classes who were going to school that they be taught in their local language, in this case, Tamil. And if this is the case, uh, how does that impact the, um, since the educated classes all seem to know English, how does this impact the ability of these people who are in local schools speaking local languages to move up the economic and social ladder? Can I take that? You know, um, what you post is a debate which we keep having every day, every day. Nobody knows the answers. But to, we know the issue, at the, the debate goes something like this. If you, uh, Tamil Nadu incidentally is a very advanced state, probably the two most socially developed states in the whole of India. The problems that you hinted at are much more acute in other states, but nonetheless the issue is something like this. When we say, shall we do primary education in English, the obstacle to that is, the child has no other resources other than the school to practice English. Where at home it's not spoken, the home that she comes from, he or she comes from. Uh, so its ability to understand concepts thereby is limited because he or she does not have verbal facility in English. So experiments show that they tend to then learn by rote. You know what Howard Gardner call, called the, the correct answer problem. She, the child tries to guess what is the answer for something and gives it. On the other hand, if you take it in Tamil, or Malayalam as the case may be, the conceptual understanding is very deep, okay? But they tend to lose out on verbal facility. One of the interesting studies that I did was, uh, somebody mentioned that I'm chairman of IM Calcutta, which is one of the institutions uh, where 350,000 kids are tested and 2,000 are taken into the IIM system. It, it's the apex of the in Indian educational system. But this year at the convocation, a few months ago, after I delivered the convocation speech, a parent of the third ranking student came to meet me. 
and he was wearing traditional Indian clothes, and his wife was wearing traditional Indian clothes. He was very apologetic. He said, I do not speak English. The parent did not speak English. Then the son, who had just got the diploma, came next to me and explained that the farmer is a peasant in a place called Telangana with four acres. So Telangana is the back of beyond. You can't, I don't know what the equivalent in America is. He had four acres of land making dal, lentils. I, that kid has gone to a local medium school. He topped the school exam, went into the IIT, which is an even bigger obstacle to get, and I can't explain to you the difficulty there is, and then went into IIM. And that kid this year was joining one of the Wall Street firms at $200,000 salary. I mean, tears came to my eyes. So things do work in some ways. They do work, but not enough. He is studying in Telugu, the original language, right through. He, even the son, children learn English very quickly after school, very quickly, because higher education is all in English. But this is a moral debate. It, you know, we just passed the right to free and compulsory education in India. That debate goes on. I mean, welcome, you jo please join in. We don't know the answers. Nobody knows the answers to these. Um, um, I'm Suveer Kaul. Uh, I have an observation and then a, a brief question. The observation is, uh, you're probably right that uh, Gandhiji's intervention in Champaran uh, caused certain kinds of technological setbacks. We missed out on the cracking of the benzene ring. ring. But given our historical circumstances, I would say that what he achieved there is more important for our understanding of ourselves as an innovative, creative people. That is, he pro proved that we could mobilize successfully, even locally, against uh, an what seemed like an insuperable force that denied our very capacity to think of ourselves as creative, political individuals. So for me, that is the long-term, uh, a crucial long-term development that allows, and it astonishes somebody of my generation to hear somebody like Bruce and Nussbaum describe Indians uh, or India as a culture of innovation. Because 20 years ago, you would not have heard this vocabulary. We all knew that we were very good at adapting. That is, the large mass of people were wonderful at being able to adapt in order to survive their daily circumstances. That's not the culture of innovation. I watched the body language of the new carders of Indians in airports internationally. 20 years ago, when I, or even longer, when I came to graduate school in this country, I used to look around me, and you watched Indians, upper middle class Indians, a little hesitant about the way they took on the world. Now, this has its hyperbolic and aggressive uh, elements to it, not ones that celebrate my afternoon paper will address some of that. But it has allowed a whole generation or more of people to begin thinking of themselves in the kinds of terms that this panel has addressed. That's my observation. My question is, NASCOM exists, as we know, not simply to allow a, a forum for entrepreneurial or intellectual exchange. It also exists as a massive kind of lobbying uh, a group. And I worry sometimes, without knowing the, interior, uh, the details, which is why this is a question for you, Mr. Balakrishnan, there used to be a logic in the, when, the 40s and the 50s in the US where what was good for Detroit was supposedly good for America. We know the incalculable global costs of that form of thinking. We're still paying those costs. We'll pay them for a long time to come. Is there the possibility, do you worry about the possibility that this logic, what's good for NASCOM, is good for India, is something that has a, a destructive underpinning, not just the kind of qualitative, innovative thinking that you've been celebrating. You know, I was in the executive committee of NATCOM for, I don't know, 10 years. They're less powerful than they appear to be from, <laughs> from outside. Uh, they had a role to play, and I think the primary appeal of the IT serv the services part, the you know, offshoring part of the IT industry to politicians was that it provided jobs. And if you ever stand for election in any country in the world, any place, even New York City, if you, if you can be seen as job promoting, you are a good guy, you're likely to win. Now for Indian politicians, it is, you know, to support NASCOM and say good things about it comes naturally because if you can attract a IT services uh, shop into your district and provide jobs for 10,000 graduates, and it's incalculable. Some of the appeal of NASCOM is that, and that sometimes I worry that things may be up for change because 
two weeks ago, I was having a drink with one of the CEOs of, is it, I, to, to mask his identity, I call him one of the three largest IT services companies in India. So I asked him, what keeps you awake at night? And that's a good question, as you know. He says, Ajit, till last year, for every billion dollars of revenue, we could employ 40,000 people. That is the ratio. And my challenge is, in the next two years, for every billion dollars of revenue, we are able to afford only 20,000 people. So really, NASCOM is a job giver. That era may be slowing down, as, you know, as a, as a totality, because the rupee has become expensive uh, compared to the US dollar. So they are on a productivity binge. So I think those challenges are appearing. But trust me, NASCOM is not as powerful. And people, they don't get automatically listened to. I've been on both sides negotiating with NASCOM, and I've been part of the NASCOM executive committee. We're almost out of time, but I want to both press you a little bit and take the two last questions and then give everyone a chance to respond. Uh, first, to press you a little bit on Savir Kal's question, you say NASCOM is not very powerful. No, but it, as, uh, as, not as powerful as they appear. All, all right, <coughs> but let, let me just um, ask you then, to comment on India's decision to enter the intellectual property rights regime on terms that many people found surprising and perhaps unfavorable to India's national interest understood in a more popular uh, or, or in a more broad-based uh, way, in particular because the price for India entering that regime, which of course the IT industry very much wanted it to do to safeguard its sectoral interests, was to accept uh, 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 the, well, was to tie its hands with respect to generic drugs and other kinds of, of, um, of, of, uh, of rights that it would have had outside of the regime, which uh, might well have served, uh, served the interests of many people, including many poor people. So w w the question of why India happen? made to, made, a, made the decision to do this is, is, is not one that, uh, that I think many of us uh, I'll give understand. you an answer. I'll give you the but, answer. And it may not have been industry pressure, but it may have been, nevertheless, the thinking that what's good for Detroit is good for America. Uh, yeah. But the, before you give the answer, let me, let's take the other two questions and so that we can collate the answers to, to all of these, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. And please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Ava Zeider. Um, I just have a question um, going to uh, the culture of India. I'm just, we're hearing a lot of information that I think is rather high level and very insightful, but I just wonder who in India shares your views and what, what are the views of other sectors of the Indian culture about education and IT? Um, do they see IT, I mean, do, do various sectors in the culture view IT as, as you know, is a very hopeful or is, is a very powerful way to transform the country? And are they, do they hear what we as Americans hear? I mean, do they, do they hear, or are they struggling with the uh, quality of education issues that, that we hear about, about engineering schools? Uh, I'm just wondering, I, I'm, I'm, I hear the issues and I'm just wondering what do the people over in India think at, at various levels of society? Okay, and uh, this last question here, please. Thank you. I want to just, my name is Raman. I spent one year trying to teach in a very uh, premier graduate school. And it goes right back to the problem that she cited and also to the problem that Professor Call was talking about. They're building in India, it seems to be that uh, it's, uh, it's going in a wrong direction because they're building all these graduate schools without improving primary education. Everywhere in India, you, you get, you, uh, Ajit mentioned IITs and IAMs. I'm one of those guys who couldn't get into it, but I could get into US very easily without any problem. And they're now building so many IITs. Some of those IITs do not have faculties. I went to a very premier business school. I couldn't even find 50 students that would meet my qualifications. So I just had to quit India and I came back to US. So how can we build the 14th floor, which is the graduate schools, without making sure the first floor is very strong and laid out to a certain spec. And if you could address, there are so many anomalies. We only hear certain things about India. Uh, in, in the, I mean, this conference is about so, social structure, cleanliness problems. I mean, no matter, I mean, India has improved quite a bit. I'm very happy about that. You could get a heart surgery there at a much affordable price than in the US. But that's only a small segment of your life. 
Okay. I think can we I, should uh, wrap up just yeah. because of so time. Can I just drop into India somewhere in a random place and expect to have a decent life that I could get in uh, Beerton, West Virginia, where I come from? I lived there for 15 years. I know how that is. It's a very small town. And you couldn't find an airport 100 miles close to that. But I could have a very decent life in Vietnam. It's not any different from New York. Okay, I, I can't do that in India. You. What's the problem? Okay. Thank you very much. I think we're already a little bit behind time, so perhaps if you could very quickly give your reactions and we'll, uh, we'll end. You know, to answer the question on why they said we can have fall fast on the intellectual property right, you know, the opposition to that came from the India pharmaceutical industry. Now, they've decided that it's no longer in the interest to oppose it. That's where the change came. I think the IT industry was uh, sitting in the middle saying, we're not quite sure what this means to us. So the pharmaceutical people have decided that they get more benefit by joining the TRIPS regime than opposing it. Uh, I go back to the thing about Gorbachev's answer, why did glass not happen? The Russian elite wanted it to happen. They felt they'd get a better deal in the new regime, something of the same kind. Uh, Thank you. Madam Shu asked a question on what is a social discourse? Um, is quality of education being debated? Not as much as we would, I would like it to be. It is debated in the inner circles of uh, government very much. It is debated in uh, magazines like the Economic and Political Weekly, if you've seen that, that uh, uh, circulates only 10,000 copies, but everyone, you go to a decision maker's room, you find it on his table. Uh, but not as much in the lay press. Uh, lay press and lay media, uh, I think, will top American media in terms of its entertainment value. They do things, corruption stories and all kinds of stories to entertain people. There is a a lot of concern about the quality of education. Tremendous amount. I'm working around two task forces on that itself. But again, nobody knows the answer because, you know, I, if you know the answer, tell me, because what constitutes a high quality education? Many of the elite institutions throughout the world appear to be credentialing institutes. You get a label, say you're from Harvard or from New School or from IIM Calcutta, and that gives you a passport into the world. We're not sure, so join the debate. We don't know the answer. We really don't know the answer. Um, I mean, um, I guess I can sort of, I agree with Jeet uh, that uh, it's not being debated as much as it should be. Um, I guess, let me see. I mean, my sort of experiences have been more hands-on, um, you know, in, in, in the sense that even though I'm in academia, I work a lot with the industry. So a case in point was, um, so I'm involved with a startup in, uh, you know, in a state called Andhra Pradesh, which is in the southern part of India, uh, in a city called Hyderabad. And um, while you know, the startup is doing well, it's growing, we are sort of constantly looking for newer employees and new you know, recruitment and so on. And so on and off, when we look for recruitment, um, you know, uh, this, there comes this debate between, okay, should we hire somebody who's got a local indigenous degree, as in all entire education in India, versus someone who's come back from the US with a degree here and then is trying to settle in India? And, you know, honestly, it's, I, I just can't generalize. You know, I, I just can't say that it's always the case that one is better than the other. It's just uh, on a case by case basis. So, in those kind of circumstances, uh, these are all informal situations where we have this debate about, uh, you know, the quality of education in India versus abroad. Um, but um, I guess we could do with more, uh, more of a governmental focus and concern. Thank you. You know, I'm increasingly struck by uh, the similarities of problems. Um, among the U.S. and India and China. Uh, there, the U.S. has a, the same problem in terms of extremely high quality uh, college and university uh, education and extremely low quality education among most of its uh, urban public schools. There is an enormous problem between uh, equity, uh, the gap between uh, the rich and the poor uh, in the U.S. is growing dramatically. Uh, the uh, issues of corruption by elites is an enormous, I mean, here we just legalize it and call it lobbying, but it's basically the same thing. Um, and, um, and then uh, on the other side, you know, there's a more optimistic view of uh, 
generations that are, in fact, uh, more capable and more creative and more optimistic. But uh, uh, the problems that used to divide uh, uh, what was once known as, you know, first world, third world, or advanced, or this or that, seem to be uh, morphing into uh, very different ones and very similar ones as we sort of move into, uh, I don't know, the new century. It's uh, just striking and unifying. Thank you. That's a very, I think, apt note on which to end. Please join me in very warmly thanking the panelists. Thank you.